All right, so I guess uh, I guess we'll get started. Um, welcome to Philly Posh for June 5th, uh, 2014. Uh, tonight, uh, we're glad to have with us uh, Jeffrey Hicks. Unfortunately, uh, Jeff had some um, family issues that prevented him from coming to join us in person, but he's uh, graciously uh, made time to present to us remotely about uh, desired state configuration, which uh, would be a really gl uh, cool topic to hear about. Um, Jeff is a uh, trainer, uh, multi-year uh, MVP award recipient for uh, Windows PowerShell. Uh, he's also an author of several books, and we have, uh, thanks to our, our sponsor Manning tonight, we have a few giveaways. We have a PowerShell Deep Dives um, physical book. We got a Tool Making in a Month of Lunches book. Uh, we have an ebook to give away, and we also have a discount code, courtesy of Manning, that I'll post in the chat. Um, that's a 44% uh, discount on any purchase that you make over the course of the next 11 days. So um, with that said, thank you very much to Manning. Thank you to, uh, to Jeff for presenting for us tonight. And uh, Jeff, uh, by all means, take it away. All right, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for the last second um, change here. I had family, you know, kids kind of make your life <clears throat> interesting. And so we've got actually exciting things happening, but it kind of changed my travel plan. So I wasn't really able to come down to Philadelphia, but hopefully this will work out uh, just as well. <clears throat> Tonight, I wanted to talk about uh, desired state configuration or DSC. Uh, if you were at TechEd in Houston, uh, you realize or probably saw a number of sessions, DSC was the hot topic it's what everyone wants to know about. It's a big topic. Uh, tonight, I'm just going to give you what I call it an introduction. I just want to kind of get your feet wet, let you, for those of you who have not seen DSC before, see what it looks like, see how it works, <clears throat> understand what some of the commandlets are, see what it takes to kind of get started. All right, so that's kind of what we're going to go through. I'm going to go through a bunch of slides uh, somewhat quickly. And then I'll get into doing some live uh, demonstrations at the end. All of my slides and demos will be shared um, with you uh, to Toledo, and he'll sum up on your uh, on the Philly Posh GitHub repository or wherever. So, without much more intro, let's start talking about DSC. So, what is DSC? Well, DSC is an extension, really, to the PowerShell language. You're able to use everything you know about PowerShell to create configuration scripts. We'll talk a, a little bit more about how these scripts are created and why we're creating these scripts. But you're able to leverage your existing PowerShell knowledge of syntax and variables and everything you know about PowerShell to build these configuration scripts. We can also use PowerShell to create and manage these server configuration files. PowerShell ships in version 4 with um, some commandlets to create and deploy these configurations to the server. A configuration, kind of getting ahead of my briefly, is just basically a list of settings that you want a server to have. And we can use PowerShell to build that list and then push it to the server, and then the server takes care of it from there. The whole point here is that you can always ensure that your servers are configured the way that you need them to be. On the server, on the remote server, there's a local configuration manager <clears throat> that looks at your configuration, and he does all the hard work, all the heavy lifting. You don't have to figure out how to configure a service or create a registry entry. You just tell the server, hey, I need a registry key that looks like this, and it'll do the rest for you. And we'll use PowerShell to do all of this for us. Now, the reason for all of this is to, for one thing, to prevent what we call server drift. You know, you build a server, you get it nice and pretty and tidy in the way that you want it to be, and then you let it go into production. Well, things happen, right? Um, other admins or technicians get on and they delete stuff or they stop services or just 
the course of just Windows running, things change. So using DSC is a way of preventing that server configuration drift. What we end up doing is separating configuration from implementation. So we no longer worry so much about constantly trying to implement a configuration. We just build the configuration and let the server take care of it itself in terms of deploying or configuring itself. What this allows us to do is basically think of this as continuous server deployment. This is kind of in the DevOps world now where we're <clears throat> just building, we've got tools that will allow us to build and deploy servers and we're kind of continuously deploying it. We're always making sure that it is configured the way that we need it to be. If we need to make a change, say we need to add a registry entry, we can update the configuration, push the new configuration, or have the server pull a new configuration, and the server is in essence kind of redeployed with the fresh, configura the fresh configuration that we need it to have. PowerShell, cloud, right? That was the big story at, at TechEd. DSC is a big part of that. You can use this to manage servers on site or ideally in the cloud where you can't really go to the bots. And so you're going to be, DSC will become really important for, for that sort of situation. And again, the big thing here is that you can leverage your existing PowerShell skills. I always say that PowerShell is the glue, and I think I've seen Jeffrey Snover talk about this as well. It's the glue that holds everything together that we do. We can work with PowerShell interactively in a shell. We can work with it in a script. We've got commandlets and, and functions and snap-ins and modules. And then we have extensions to the language like Workflow and now DSC, where like Workflow and DSC, they're not really PowerShell in the way of, of a script, but they use PowerShell techniques and technologies to get their job done. DSC is kind of like that. So if you want to start playing in the DSC world, you will need PowerShell 4, which means the Windows Management Framework 4, primarily because this is going to add this new SIM namespace, as well as give you the, the DSC commandlets, the providers, and the resources. This will also require the .NET Framework 4.5. And even though most of the time you're going to be running this on Server 2012, because that ships with Windows 4, it is possible to run Windows, I'm sorry, Windows Management Framework 4 or PowerShell 4 on down-level clients, but on the server, <clears throat> seems to be 2008 R2 Service Pack 1 is the bare minimum that you'll need if you want to have on the server to use DSC. Right now, DSC is really a server-oriented tool. It, it is possible to do some stuff with DSC, uh, like I said, with Windows 8 clients, but it's not really there yet. So if you can hold off on <clears throat> DSC and client side, I think eventually that picture will get clear. So we're just going to be focusing on working with DSC and servers. <clears throat> on the client side, yeah, it will work. Uh, again, you'll need Windows 7, Service Pack 1 or later. Basically, the machines that can run PowerShell version 4. So what you'll want is a machine, preferably Windows 8 or 8.1, running PowerShell 4, and then your server is all running PowerShell 4. So you can build your configurations on your client and then push them or set up your server environment to pull configurations. I'm going to talk about push and pull in just a second. If you are deploying PowerShell 4 and I'm sure you use DSC for Windows 8.1 and Server 2012 R2, there is a very important hotfix uh, referenced by the KB article. You see there on the slide. You need to make sure that that gets installed. If that is not installed, uh, you'll probably have trouble running DSC. So a little gotcha there to be aware of. DSC does take advantage of PowerShell remoting. So obviously that must be enabled on 2012R2. Remoting is now enabled by default. And I think most places are realizing, yeah, PowerShell remoting, it's OK. We're, it's necessary. We're going to have to have it. But I want to list that there as a requirement. Now, I'm just going to be setting up DSC in my 
test tonight where I'm just going to be pushing configurations. At some point, you will put, set up a web server where you will have your servers pull their configurations. When you start going down that route, which is a little more complicated, which is one of the reasons we're not going to get into it tonight, uh, that will require some so you want to have some sort of uh, PKI so you can set up SSL and encryption certificates that you can use in configuring your DSC setup. So what's the architecture look like? Well, as I said, there are two models here. There's a push model. This is where you build your configurations and then you manually push them to these servers. You deploy them to the server using the start DSC configuration commandlet. Once the server gets that configuration, the server looks at it and goes, oh, I'm supposed to, to create a folder. I'm supposed to create a local user account. I'm supposed to configure a service. It knows how to do those things. You don't have to tell it how. It'll just do it. You just tell it what the server should look like, what the user account should look like. Or you can set up the pull model, which is a little more complicated. Here you can set up a centralized server. Most people will go ahead and set up a web server using IIS. You can configure it with just traditional HTTP. Preferably, though, you'll want to set up configure. You'll want to set up SSL, which H with HTTPS. Uh, it, it is also possible to set this up as a file share on an SMB server. Now, the nice thing here is that if you've got a lot of servers, and it's important that they have their configuration, but you know, you, you want to make sure that you don't overwhelm the web server or that you provide fault tolerance. Well, we already know how to load balance or cluster web servers and file servers. So that all just stays the same. There's nothing new there. The website that sets up the configuration, you can load balance and configure however you want to do, just like any other website. When you deploy your DSC configurations, you just tell the remote servers, hey, this is where you're going to go to get your configurations. Again, that's a little more complicated. And I'm not going to get into the pull model tonight. We're just going to be looking at the push model. Is there a question there? No. Sorry. All right. So DSC actually falls into three phases or stages. There's the authoring phase. This is where you create these MOF files. A lot of DSC is based on open standards. Microsoft and the PowerShell team going much more to, to open standards. So we can use PowerShell to create these MOF files. MOF is just a standard industry accepted format. It's not a proprietary format or anything like that. And it's really just a text file. Technically, you could just use Notepad if you knew the structure to create the MOF definition. But in the authoring phase, we'll be using the PowerShell IAC and the PowerShell commandlets. And you can declare imperative or declarative commands to build your configurations, to build your definitions. Then we have the staging phase where we have our MOFs. We build the MOFs and they're calculated per node or per server. In a push model, you know, the, the, the MOFs will be on this computer wherever you created it. If you have a pull server, you would get those MOF files to the pull server as well as any resources that they might require. And then the last stage is the make it so phase. Now, you'll probably often hear a lot of people talk about PowerShell and DSC in, in terms of Jean-Luc Picard and Star Trek Next Generation where, you know, Picard just says, make it so, and Riker goes and figures out how to do it. Well, you don't have to tell, you don't have to figure out how to do it. You just say, this is what I want done. And the provider, which ties to the resource that you specify in the configuration, and all this will become, I think, a little clearer once I get into the, the demonstration. The provider on that server for that resource knows what to do, and they just make it so. Once you have your configuration out, 
then we can start managing it. Now, here's a really important note here. There is one configuration, in other words, one MOF file per server. It's not a cumulative, it's not like group policy where things are cumulative. You have to build and plan so that you have one configuration. That configuration is managed by the LCM or local configuration manager that's running on your server joining PowerShell version 4. What this is going to force you to do is really plan ahead and try to think modular. Because you will want, because you'll probably will have some settings that might apply to all of your servers. And then for, you might have a, a set of configurations for web servers and maybe another set for file servers and maybe another set for domain controllers and a set for some particular line of business server. There are things where you can create what are called composite resources to try to bundle some of these core functionality together. But you're going to have to think about and do a lot of testing in a non-production environment to see how this all works. But it ultimately comes down to one configuration, one MOF file per server. Even though I'm going to be showing you the push model, just so you can see what, config what configurations look like, how to get one, how to test it, how to see it all happen, eventually, if you go down the DSC road, you will want to implement the pull model, because that will simplify management um, tremendously, I think. So the local configuration manager, you can use a command called get DSC local configuration manager, that's one of the long ones, to check the settings for the LCM on a particular node. And some of the settings you'll want to check will be the configuration mode, which tells which PowerShell, or the, I'm sorry, the LCM will look and say, hey, am I just supposed to apply the configuration? Am I supposed to apply and just watch if there are changes? Or am I supposed to apply, and if there's a change, automatically fix it? Uh, you also can specify the mode, whether you're pushing or pulling, uh, the refresh frequency, and the mode frequency configuration check. Ideally, and the reason I said you want to go to a pull model is in a pull model, I believe by default, every 15 minutes, the LCM will look and pull a configuration, look for a newer configuration, and also check to make sure, hey, I'm supposed to have these settings, and my settings don't match what are in the file. Let me fix myself. So you know what? You don't have to keep constantly going back and checking, hey, is that service running? Is that service running? Is that service running? DSC should handle that for you. And again, pull will make that, I think, even easier than a push model. So that's where we're kind of heading here with DSC. You can configure the LCM with DSC through a configuration. All right, so we kind of have an idea here to create a configuration. Uh, again, the configuration could be done just in Notepad or any other third-party tool that knows how to create a MOF file. But because we're PowerShell, we're going to use a PowerShell script. And by script, I just mean it's in a PS1 file. And you'll see why in a moment. So we're going to use PowerShell IC in version 4 because it's DSC aware. So we'll get syntax highlighting all the nice features we get with the ISC. In the ISC, we're going to use the configuration keyword. So instead of function or workflow, we're going to use configuration. And this will actually become a new command type in PowerShell version 4. We then define a node or nodes by computer name or an array of computer names. And then within each node that we want, we configure the resources and how we want them set for things like services and files, registry. Those are just the ones out of the box. Um, IP address and just lots and lots of things that are coming down 
uh, out of Microsoft and out of the community, we configure that. Now, your configuration can have multiple nodes and multiple resources. It can get really complex. But you can also take advantage of variables and arrays and all the stuff that you already know how to do in writing a PowerShell script. We're kind of just doing that in a PowerShell file to create the configuration. So these resources that I'm talking about, the resource is the managed element that you define in your configuration. Again, things like services, registry keys, environmental variables. There are a number of core resources that are shipped out of the box. Those are the ones that I'll, I'll show you here in a moment. In addition, Microsoft over the last couple months has been releasing a number of what they call DSC waves, which include some experimental resources. And they're experimental only in the sense that they are not, I guess, officially supported yet. Um, all of the resources that are identified as, as experimental will have an X uh, prefix before the name of the resource. You can identify them that, well, oh, this is probably pretty good, um, but technically uh, is still experimental. And then there are also a number of resources developed by the community. Uh, on PowerShell.org, if you follow the links, they, there is a uh, DSC resource, community resource on GitHub as well. And most, if not all, of the community resources, the accepted format is to prefix those resources with the letter C. And you can obviously write your own resources. Well, I say obviously, you can do that. Um, a little more complicated than writing a script, although if you have some students writing modules, you should be able to come up with a resource, not something I'm going to be able to get into tonight. But you can write your own resource as well if there's not a resource that's out there that someone hasn't already come up with. And there are new ones people coming up with all the time. This is a list of this the out of the box resources. So these are all the things and a fresh install of PowerShell 4 you should be able to configure on a server. This is not using any of the experimental resources or any of the community resources, stuff out of the box. And these are some of the ones that I'll use in my demonstration. To find out what resources are installed, you can use the get DSC resource commandlet. If you just run get DSC resource, it will show you all of the resources installed on your computer. Or you can specify a single resource, as I've done in the screenshot there. Because one of the things that is in that resource is a set of properties. In this case, such as name, built-in account, credential, depends on startup type and state. Those are the settings that you can specify in your DSC configuration. And then in values, those would be the values. When I get to my actual configuration, you'll see where that all comes into play. But that's how you can discover what resources you have to work with. So those are the possible resource settings. And those are the possible values that you can use. Here is, and again, I'll, I'll do a live demo here in just a moment. Here is a configuration. So I have a configuration called Chicago servers. You can call it whatever you want. I don't think there's much. You really don't need to have the standard verb now because it's not really, we're not doing any verb now. So the configuration should be. I think whatever makes sense to you. I don't believe we have come up with much in the way of in sort of community standards or accepted best practice for naming uh, DSC configurations. So I just call mine whatever it seems appropriate so I, I know what it means. So I've got configuration Chicago service. Then you've got your open, close, curly break, curly break, curly brackets. Again, just like a, a workflow or a, a function. It can take parameters. Um, we're going to then define one or more nodes. This sample here just has a single node. And I'm able to pass, instead of hard coding in a server name, I when I run the Chicago servers configuration, I can build my MOF and apply a computer name dynamically. 
Within that node then are the resources, such as a file resource. In this one, I want to create a directory called reports. I want to configure the Windows Update Service to be running and start up automatically. And I want to make sure that the Windows Backup feature is installed, including all sub-features. So when I build this configuration and create the MOF files for a given set of computers, those are the settings that will be applied on that machine, wherever I push this to. And the LCM will look at that and go, OK, I know how to make that happen. I'll take care of it for you. I got this. Hold my beer, that sort of thing. So to deploy the configuration, again, in a push model, we're going to first define the configuration and load it into the shell, Chicago Core Config. That PS1. So I'm basically dot sourcing. Now, what I didn't show, and I should I'll have to fix this in the slides before I share the slides. That Chicago Core should have a set of computer names after it. So, because Chicago Core, if I go back here to my, that's an extra. I should probably fix that so it matches my sample here. So I'll call it Chicago servers. That. Configuration, the PS1 file has my configuration. If I'm not including the computer names, then I need to specify that when I run the command, and you'll see this in my demonstration here in a moment, that will create the MOF files. And then the third part is to actually use start DSC configuration and push the MOF files to the specified computers. Once they are applied, and this really doesn't take too long, you can use get DSC configuration to look to see what's been applied, what are the current settings. Now, you may need to use some filtering to find specific resources, or if you have multiple computers, you want to see what sorts of things are applied or are not applied. So here's what the command looks like, get DSC configuration. This can use sim sessions, although you don't have to have a pre-established sim session. You can just use the computer name, and it will create an ad hoc sim session, just like you would with get sim instance or any of the other sim commandlets. Or you could, if dollar all say is a list of computer names, I could do something like this, where I want to find all of the configurations that have to do with services and then look at the name, startup type, and state. So I could see in my configurations which ones, which services maybe aren't running that I want running, or vice versa, depending on what I've configured. And then this is what it looks like. All right, so in this screenshot, uh, the remote registry service is supposed to be running on Chicago Core 01 and FP02. So that's one way that I'm able to identify machines that the configuration is broken and no longer doing what I am expecting it to. So if you want to test a configuration, as again, all of this is maintained by the LCM. You don't have to constantly go and test and, and verify that everything is the way that you want it to be. Although you certainly can, there's a command that we'll look at here in a moment that you can test if you want to make sure that your servers are still matching their configuration. If they're not, you could force a reconfiguration. Uh, you can even push a new configuration if you wanted to. If you're using a pull model, you really shouldn't have to do much of anything. Uh, the, the LCM should just fix things for you. Model, as I said, probably the best approach long term. So the command that you're going to use is called test DSC configuration. This will just give you a true or false answer. If there are multiple things that are wrong, though, it will return false and won't keep testing anything else. It basically returns seems to return false at the first thing that is broken, if you will. 
I recommend if you're doing this, just to test one server at a time, because all you see is just true or false. So even if you specify a group of computers, you'll see true, true, false, true. You may not necessarily know which true or false goes with which computer, unless you use dash verbose, which will give you a little more detail about what things it is testing, and then you'll be able to tell what item it's failing on. But again, if for some reason you have a configuration where more than one item is failing, you won't see the second failed item. You, you'll only see the first failed item in the verbose output. And that's a pretty easy to use test DSC configuration. Again, the same session, and it will return true or false unless you use dash verbose. So, any questions on anything that I've talked about so far before we get into showing this to you more in action? Any questions or anything? No, it seems like uh, we're following along pretty well here. Okay. All right, so let me see if I can get... All right, so I'm going to do this from the shell ISE here. So, a <clears throat> few things here. There is a module called PS Desired State Configuration. That's where all the, the commands are. Get DSC resource. Retrieve all of the elements, all of the elements you could use in a node configuration. So if I run this file itself, it's going to go through, and this takes a little bit of time to run. I think this runs a little bit faster in the V5, in the PowerShell V5 uh, preview. I think they fixed some performance issues here with this commandlet. But eventually this will come back and show me all of the resources running on that, that are available for me to use in a configuration on this uh, desktop. I'm running Windows 8.1 client here. Uh, you can ignore these composite ones. These are uh, left over from my attempts at building some composite resources as well as reset, but file, all these that say PowerShell, those are out of the box. And then the properties are the things that go with it. Now, what's nice here, because one of the problems when you're building a node is trying to figure out, gosh, how do I figure what syntax to use? So you could say, oh, you know, I want to use that registry resource. Well, there is a dash syntax parameter, which is kind of handy. And it's got to go through and find them all again. Give us a moment. I should have saved those results to a variable and all right, so that's then what you would put in this is basically the configuration you would put in a node element in your configuration. I'm going to show you a better way in a moment and what I came up with than using that. So here is a configuration. I've got the configuration keyword. I'm calling mine Chicago servers. This should be kind of what was in the... I wonder if he knows he dropped. All right. Lido. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Apparently, if I don't use my move my mouse around in the browser, it kicks me out of the meeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which didn't do me any good because I'm full screen. Oh, uh, jeez. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, I just made you a presenter again, so. All right, let's. <laughs> oh, grief. Now, of course, I don't know what the last thing was that you heard. When did... Hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we started with the very beginning. No, I'm 
So you were covering the um, the syntax of the registry resource. Okay. You were, you were showing us how to how to retrieve the syntax of it. All right. So okay. So we'll we'll come back to that because there's a better way to do that. Okay. All right. So I you did not hear me talk at all about the configuration and what this looks like and how to use it. Um, no, we did we we missed that part. All right. Are we recording again, or uh, let me just double check and make sure? I think we are. Yeah. Yeah, it's recording. All right. Yeah, yeah we're we're good. All right. So here is what a configuration looks like, and I have to remember at some point within. I think I got to be active every eight minutes. I don't know if there's a way to. Let me see. If there's a way to modify that. Sounds like you need to write a script for that, Jeff. <laughs> no. I've never run into that before because I've used the, the live meeting, or I'm sorry, the uh, link web client before and never had a problem with it timing out on me. Anyway, moving on. I'll try to get through this here. So this is what I can figure out looks like. You've got the configuration keyword, whatever you want to call it, and then a set of curly braces. Just function. Your configuration can take parameters if you want. In this case, I need to define a node. My configuration is going to do the same settings for whatever computers I specify whenever I run this command called Chicago servers. And what it's going to do is configure these three resources. A file resource called reports, which is going to create this directory. I want to configure the Windows update service and make sure that the Windows backup feature is installed. I don't have to understand how any of that gets set up on the server. That's what the LCM will handle. I'm just saying this is what I want to do. Make it so. So when I run this configuration or load it into my session, this is a new command. It's a new command type called configuration. And this even has help. <clears throat> I, in my case, because this configuration script, if you will, requires me to specify a, a computer name. Now, I could have put in a default value like you would in a script or a function, but decided not to do that. When I run this configuration, it will create a set of moth files in a subdirectory with the same name as your configuration. In this case would be Chicago servers. It will create it in the current directory. So when I run this, it's going to create it under the scripts folder, because that's what I'm in here. Unless I use dash output path, to specify a different folder. So I'm going to variable and kind of walk through this for three different computers, which I hopefully are also running on my network. And now I'm going to run that command specifying that array of servers. And this very quickly, as you can see, creates three moth files, one for each computer name. You could have, again, you could use any tool you want to generate that MOF file as long as you understand the, the syntax and the format of that file. Here we're just using PowerShell. So what I'm going to do is now start the, I want to push that configuration. The start DSC configuration, you can specify, you specify the path to your configuration folder where all the MOF files are. By default, it will go through every single computer name, or if you want, you can limit it with a specific computer name. The default behavior is also to run this as a background job. So if I were to run this without dash wait, I would get three background jobs. But I want you to see what it's going to do, so I'm going to use the dash wait parameter. And there, you can see that is running. And I got a problem there. Something failed 
execute on one of my machines already. Let me make sure that I haven't lost connections. Uh, you still there, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not, uh, and I think the problem is I ran into this before. It's not Windows feature backup. It is um, it. I'm going to double check the name here. It's just called Windows Server Backup. See what I did there? This is the name that it wants. My configuration has a typo. This should be Windows Server Backup. I'm going to save that. Now, because of the change here, I could go in and edit the MAW files. Well, I can do that. I'm just going to rerun, resave that, and then come back here and rerun my configuration to generate a new set of MAW files. And now I can push it out. There we go. Kind of looks like a workflow, doesn't it? So it's running in parallel on all those three machines, pushing and building the configuration. And I'm done. I have now configured those three servers with these settings that I specified in this configuration. Now we can test that with get DSC configuration. So this returns basically an object for every type of resource. So here's my directory resource for reports. There's that Windows Server backup. And then here is the Windows Server, uh, the Windows Update Service. See present, and these settings are the way that I want them to be. So that's one way that you can identify what things are working. And I could also use test DSC configuration to test, and this will return true or false if it's working right. So that is working just fine. Now I'm going to go in and manually break things. So I'm going to uninstall the Windows backup on Core 01, simulating, you know, someone, some junior admin said, log out of the service, oh, we don't need that, and removed it. And I want to also go in and remove the reports folder from a couple of the servers. All right, so I, just, I basically just manually broke my configurations. So now, FP02, which I didn't touch, should be, that's still good. Now, doesn't test properly. And if I do a post testing, now I get rid of the reports folder and the Windows Update or sorry, the Windows Backup Service feature on Core 01, but the test only shows me. It only goes until it finds a first false. So file reports, you can see it tested that and returned false. I have no way of knowing what else might be false. I suppose really the only way you can do that is if you go back to get DSC configuration, you can come here and see this now says to absent, where I know that I want that to be present. And reports is absent. And again, I know I want that to be present. So there are some ways that you can figure out, you know, what's broken. Now, to fix that, really the easiest thing to do is because I'm not in a pull situation, it's basically just re-push 
my configuration for the ones that are broken. So I'm going to use this little one line command here using the new for each method that we get in PowerShell version 4. So for my array of computers, I'm going to, for each one, I'm going to test the DSC configuration. If it's false, then I'm using dash not, so the if statement becomes true. Then I'm going to basically rerun, re-push that DSC configuration, specifying the path, and just doing it for the computer that is busted. And then again, I'm just using dash wait. So within a minute, or less than a minute, within seconds here, my servers will now be remedied and put back into compliance, back in configured the way I want them to be. Chicago FP02 was never touched because nothing was broken there. And now if I go back and test Core01 with verbose, everything returns true. And the same thing as if I were to test uh, let's do my other server here, test01. All right, so now everything is back the way I want them to be. That's really, you know, in, in a simple way, how easy it is to create a configuration. Configuration keyword, define a node for every computer that you want to manage. Uh, the node can have multiple computer names. Within each node, you then define the resources that you want and what you want them to look like. So things like file, service, feature. Now, if you're using the DS, uh, the ISC, uh, the ISC does ship with a few snippets. There is, don't look at these here yet. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. There is a, nope, nope, that's for, building your own resources. We're not going to get into that. DSC. Uh, here we go. Configuration, simple. So that kind of gives you something. What I came up with is a way of, and I post, posted this on my blog a couple weeks ago. I wrote function called new DSC configuration template that will go through and allow you to specify one or more resources and it will create a template with every single resource that it finds on your computer and all of the possible values. So if I load this function You can run this and you can specify uh, a path to save it to a file or if I'm in the IAC, I'm going to use this use IAC switch. And this is just going to use IAC. What this is going to do is basically build a template with every single resource that's available on my computer. And again, you could limit the ones that you might want to see with all the possible settings. So now all I have to do, once this finishes, is just basically delete the stuff that I don't want and configure the values that I want. I no longer have to try to guess settings do I need. So okay, so this finished here. So here's my template. Obviously you would rename that. Settings with a asterisk in front of it are mandatory. These, or those, because those are my composite resources. So this is a resource. You would give it a name. You have to give it a destination path. So you would then just put in your path. Delete whatever settings you don't need to configure. And then delete what other, other properties or values you don't want to use. So basically, pull away what you don't need. 
uh, reset is also one of mine. That's not a, a box. As is that. So you can then build this, basically run this script once, save it to a file, and then just copy and paste what you need. However, I also, after I wrote that script and posted it, I thought, you know what? Why not just have snippets do that? So I think a day or so later, again, you'll find this on my blog, should be a zip file that has all of the core out-of-the-box resources as snippets. So once you import the snippets into your ISC, then you can do control J and say, you know what, I want a environment resource. Or I need a DSC resource. So it doesn't take a lot of effort. Now I know what the settings are. I can just go in, delete what I want, edit it, and I'm I'm good to go. So all I need to do, right, to put in your configuration, my config, open and close. Give it a node name. <clears throat> if you're not using variables, I can't type and talk at the same time. <laughs> And you can any of these nodes as you want. So maybe I want for another node, who, maybe for this node, I need to have the group resource. I want to create a local group and make sure that it's configured the, the right way. So you can have as many of these resources and nodes as you want for whatever you need to do. Uh, Jeff, got a question for you. Yes, please. The um, all the actions that the local configuration manager is is doing is being logged in the Windows event logs. Is that right? Uh, there are a set of some of it's being logged in the event log. Um, there is a application log. Microsoft Windows. I believe it's all desired state configuration operational. So that's one place where I would be looking for information about what is going on. So if you, let's say you had a resource that was creating folders or files or manipulating a, you know, a service or something, is that also being logged there? Or would that be something that you would have to take account of in your scripting? Uh, I'm not sure. Let me connect to the remote ser one of the servers that I just configured. Okay. And let's look at his log and see what it says. I have not dived very deeply into the error logging. I just know that it's here. Okay. Um, so there we go. This is the configuration that was sent from, I couldn't identify the computer by, I'm assuming that's me, at, yeah, at just a few minutes ago. Configuration sent for, yeah, because there's my client. It's too bad it doesn't translate the SID. And... Oh, so there's the message that, that Windows feature backups not found. So some of this is logged. I don't think it goes into necessarily that much detail. But that's a good question to see if there are ways to get more detail. But that's where you would go to look to see what things are being logged. I don't think anything up in the system event log, uh, except for things that might be 
reflective of whatever the DSC resource is doing, such as configuring a service, mm -hmm. then if the service is obviously starting or stopping, that would show up here in the log. Gotcha. But not necessarily no indication that it's because of DSC. Cool. Thanks. Um, nope. Let me jump here to the end of my slides. So we looked at Oh, I just have the PowerPoint Viewer installed on this machine. That's why I can't jump to the end. So I'm just going to fly back through here. My last part of the slides. Uh, in terms of some resources, uh, first place you should go to is PowerShell.org and get a copy of the free ebook, the DSC book, which is kind of a living document. Don Jones and Stephen Moraski are keeping up to date. They handed out a gazillion copies, printed copies at TechEd. Um, but the most current version is online. Actually, I think it is in GitHub. I think if you go to the PowerShell.org, you'll end up back on GitHub so you can get the most current version. Uh, for those of you who don't know Stephen Moraski, PowerShell MVP, is using DSC uh, at Stack Overflow tremendously. Uh, not even worrying too much about it. You know. They're just going whole hog with it. So it's definitely getting a lot of heavy, heavy use. Uh, Don Jones, Richard Sitter, and I, uh, we are finishing up a second edition of the PowerShell In-Depth book, which will be covering version 4. And there is a chapter on DSC in that. Um, there are some other DSC resources on GitHub. And of course, the PowerShell team blog also has quite a bit um, about DSC. DSC is now the thing. You're going to see more and more coming out of Redmond about DSC. This is going to be what you need to be learning. So kind of to, in, in summary here, and then we'll come back and answer other questions. I'll show you what I can. Uh, DSC, PowerShell version 4, major feature. So if, you, if this is something you want to take advantage of on your servers, they need to be running PowerShell version 4, which means they need to be running at least 2008 R2. But man, if you can get to server 2012, it's really worth it because there are so many new PowerShell modules and commands that you can run in from a Windows 8 desktop to manage server 2012. And it's what we've wanted for years. We're finally there. But you need Windows 8 2012 or 2012 R2 and PowerShell v4. DSC just continues to leverage what you already know about PowerShell. This doesn't mean you have to stop writing scripts, because you're still going to need scripts and tools to actually look at things that you're configuring. But the main point here with DSC is instead of building a script, say, to build a server, to configure the services, to, to add the registry entries, we don't have to do that anymore. Instead, we manage the configuration and let DSC worry about how to implement it. So there's a distinction now between you know, configuration and implementation. And we can use PowerShell to build the configurations and to manage them, but we no longer have to worry too much, unless you're building your own resources, on how to actually implement that. We let DSC, we let the server worry about that, we let the server make it so. But you'll still need to have PowerShell to you know, 
monitor it and check the state of a service, create a new user account, create a mailbox or a SharePoint site. So PowerShell isn't going away in, in that regard. DSC is going to become the norm for server configuration. I think, as again, we're going to see a lot more out of this uh, from Redmond and from the community. So you got to be, you, DSC is just going to have to be on your to-do list to learn. Unless you're no longer running um, Windows. Although um, at TechEd, they did demonstrate, Microsoft did demonstrate using DSC from a Windows box to configure a Linux box. So this goal of being able to use PowerShell to manage everything in your environment, we are definitely starting down that road. And, and Jeff, there's also a pretty um, tight integration between DSC and, and managing uh, VMs in Azure, correct? Oh, probably, yeah. There, there's a lot of stuff that I think DSC will be doing that we may not even realize it's DSC. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I personally don't do much with the cloud, um, something I need to probably get into more because I just have my own little uh, home test office. Um, I don't, I don't work in a big enterprise where we have you know hundreds of VMs running in Azure and that sort of thing. But yeah, Azure cloud, basically all the stuff that we have to manage that you can't touch. So PowerShell and things like DSC become super critical to that. And so, so finally, the, you know, the big thing to take away here with DSC is you define a configuration, use PowerShell to build that configuration, and once it's out there, you just know that that's what it's going to be. You no longer have to worry about it. I, it goes back to my favorite thing, but set it and forget it. I'm going to set my configuration, let PowerShell, let the DSC do its thing, and go on and do other things. So I've got my uh, DSC stuff is on my blog. Um, you're welcome to email me. I'm on Twitter. A lot of you probably already know that. Uh, Google Plus. That's kind of what I had set aside to talk about and show you, but I'm certainly open to anything else that I can possibly show you that I have set up here. Um, cool. So what other questions you have or what else did you want to uh, see? Yeah, we, we might have a, a few questions here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you have it run external MSIs or executables to install other stuff? So the question is, uh, can you use DSC to um, run MSI installers and install other applications, third-party applications? Uh, to a certain degree, there is a there is a package resource. So if it's in the CCN. That might work for some of that. I have not done anything specifically with installers and uninstallers. But uh, based on this package resource, that, that might be a possibility. Um, I know there is also, I know there's an archive resource, which is like for zip files. No, that's that's probably that's probably something different. I know people have asked that question. I just have not tried that. This would be the first place that I would try to see if that package resource meets your your installer need. Cool. Um, I have I have a question for you, Jeff, and yeah. and that is um, when you're writing a configuration, can you you can take advantage of of the PowerShell language, right? You can do looping and vari use variables and stuff. So yes, if I had yeah. if I had let's say a handful of like maybe five services that I wanted to make sure were always running, what would that look like in a in a basic configuration? Would I put them in a for each loop and enumerate like what would that, how would that look? Well, you would just want to create in your configuration, you would just create a, if you got five services like this, you would just create a repeated node or repeated resource here. So you could have Windows Update, you could have service bits, service A, service B, service C. 
So in this case, I don't think you necessarily need to have a loop or anything. You're just going to create this for five different services for a specific computer. Okay. But I, I wouldn't replace Windows Update with a variable and then put that in an yeah. array and loop through it or anything? No, no, because you, you still, I mean, you do that if you want to, like, all the way building the configuration. Uh-huh. Um, but, no, no, you wouldn't. Because the way that this works here is this is the resource name, service. This value here is whatever you want to use to reference it. This is just an identifier. Okay. I could have called this. I just happened to call, well, whatever I called it. Windows Update. And then this, for the service, this name, this is the actual name of the service. And then, then there, here are the other elements of that go, properties that go with that service. But if I wanted, you can have as many of those service resources as you want. Same thing here with Windows features. I could have multiple Windows features. Because each resource here is unique. Even though Node will take multiple, say, multiple computer names, as far as I know, these resources all are individual or singletons. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. What uh, else? Yeah, we have another question. Can a uh, computer name be in multiple nodes? So you've got a subset of, like, everything applied to one computer, and then you add a certain subset you wanted to apply just to a separate computer. Could that be in both nodes? Uh, so if you had multiple computers, Jeff, the question is, uh, I'm sorry, repeat that again. Can the, can the computer appear in multiple nodes? Within can a computer nodes? appear in multiple nodes? Like if you had no, configuration um, that you wanted to apply to one system and then a, and then different settings that you wanted to apply to another system? Well, say you had like, I think you had the, the computer name variable for that first one and then you had a separate subset of things you wanted to apply just to one computer. Would that hit both if it was? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Here, we can I can test it real quickly. Okay. Let's do CHI test one. And I'm gonna do let's do an environment resource it's an easy. Foo. Alright, so I want and you can resources, by the way, you can also have some dependencies. So let's say for some reason that I did not want to define this resource, this environmental resource until something else finished first. You could specify the name of that other resource here in this depends on property. And I want this to be present. I'm not doing a path and I want the value to be Bar. All right, so let me rerun that. Now, I need to rebuild the files. And why did I like that? Make sure I've got to my phrases. Oh, that's because I had that nested inside that other node. Got to be careful. All right, so now that I've loaded that command, let's reboot MOF files, because we'll have one MOF file per computer. So let's look at the MOF file for test01.
So this is what the MOF file looks like. Again, just a text file. So there's that report, Windows update, Windows feature backup. Yeah, so you can have multiple, you can have the same computer can be in multiple node sets, but it's got to be in this one configuration. So now I only have one MOF file. So he's the only one that will get that foo environment resource. I look at core 01. There's the reports, there's the service, there's the Windows backup, and that's it. Okay? So, yes, so you can do that. Cool. That, that's what you're asking. That's what he was asking, right? Uh, yep. Any, any other questions? So, um, you made mention earlier of composite. Um, was it composite? Yeah, com yeah there, there are ways where you can, with a composite resource, which is a little more compli it's, it's complicated. Um, and I have not really mastered the design of building composite resources, of basically a way of bundling. I don't know. You can, you can kind of think of like an include statement or like dot sourcing so that you can modular, modularize your configurations and say, when I want this configuration, I want this set of resources, but I also want to include this set of resources from over here. Okay. But that, that's a little more complicated. I know there's some more stuff on that in the DSC book. Mm -hmm. I know that's a topic that needs to be expanded. I think for a lot of people, just using the core out-of-the-box resources, hopefully, will be enough to get them started. Unless you have a really complex environment like they have with Stack Overflow, which is why Steve is writing his own composite resources. All right, cool. Um, anybody, anybody have any other questions for Jeff? No, I think uh, I think we're good, Jeff. Thank you so much for uh, presenting for us tonight. All right, well, thank you. Uh, again, there's my contact information. I'll send you. I'll update my my slides and stuff, and patch that off and send that to you, and then you can share it off where you need it to. Yeah, we'll we'll post it on our uh, on our GitHub. All right, thanks again, All right, Jeff. Then. Thanks all. Good night. Yep. Thank. Thank you. Thank you.